Nu ska vi få se det bästa ur tv-produktionen från Handelsdagarna som har genomförts i veckan. Karriärsmässan samlade ett 70-tal bolag och är ett årligt återkommande event för att förmedla möten mellan studenter och företag. Handelseleverna producerar alltså på egen hand ett antal högprofilerade intervjuer. Och vi ser bland annat Voice vd Fredrik Jelm, Hemfrids grundare Monica Lindstedt och Volatis grundare Patrik Wallén. Här följer ett sammandrag av det mesta av det bästa. Uh, with the coronavirus, it's a little bit harder. I don't have that many people that are, you know, experts, experts in on coronavirus. Viruses. Yeah, I can imagine. But, but you know, I, you know, I've been, you know, the SARS was my first virus, and okay. you know, the bird yeah. flu. You know, so yeah. it, you know, these things come and go. The volatility does spike. This afternoon, we have WHO meeting at 1:30. Uh, should be a significant market event. In general, we'll look past on this, back on this time. Uh, you know, these things have fat tails, but most of the time, you know, if you bet on fat tails all day long, you're not going to make any money. Yeah. So, uh, so leading yeah. a hedge fund sounds almost like you know you're, you're a politician. In a, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, information is like, key. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if uh, I, I can only make decisions based off of the uh, information that I have, and I continuously make decisions on non-perfect information. So, so I have to be comfortable with the source. I have to be comfortable with the time frame that I've gotten in at, and then I have to make up my own decision. How do I feel about this? Yeah, yeah the, you know, because you know, with, with the coronavirus, with with things, you know, people are more worried about the coronavirus than you know, getting in a car crash one mile from their house. Although the probability of them dying from a car crash one mile from the house is multiple times higher than dying from the coronavirus at, at where it is right now at least. Um, so so you, you just got to have a, you know, a lot of rational um, thoughts in your head. Uh, stay calm. Uh, you know, this morning, you know, you know, there were some traders um, in London that were absolutely freaking out on levels. Um, I went long some stuff at the, at the wrong price. Yeah. Uh, and and we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Thinking, what's, what's your take on that? Why is art and culture important in Because in business? if you want to build a sustainable business, it's not just about figures. A company has a soul. People, they want to know why they're working, why they're going to work each morning to keep their motivation. And that's not, not only figures, it's, it's real life. You have to ha also have kind of bliss and you don't get bliss out of figures. You, you get bliss um, when you are um, seeing uh, something special, uh, a very nice painting or music, or it could even be a football game, other things. Yeah. So let's move into uh, InRide a little bit. What is, what, for people that aren't familiar with what you're doing, please tell us, what do you do? Yeah, so we started out because we saw that there wasn't enough initiatives to move to a sustainable solution for transportation. So that was really the first thought that we had, and that came from Robert, the CEO, that used to be at the Volvo Powertrain. And we just thought that with all this new technology, there must be somehow how you can make this smarter moving forward. So. And even though when we started out, we felt like we're going to just try to get the message out there that it's possible to do something else, that you don't really need to be stuck in the same structure that you have been for like 100 years. And so we started out with an idea that it's possible to do something else. And I think it kind of, yeah, it evolved from that. And today, I would say that we, um, or we would say that we are a freight mobility startup and that we are working on trying to solve how the operation system for autonomous and electric trucks will look like in the future. So you'd say that you're as much a logistics company that you're a, like a truck builder? I think they will come they will be much more collide in the future. Okay. Uh, because uh, you it's not going to be um, this is, a, this is what I believe. I think that in the future we need to, uh, we really need to get trucks and logistics together to work efficiently. And I think that's one of the biggest uh, things that we're going to have to work on now moving forward. And I think digitalization is a very big part of that, yeah. the first step. So I think today in Europe there's about, I'm, I'm sure you have a better, better number than I do, but I, from what I read there's about like 
only 20 to 30 percent of trucks that are moving in Europe are actually filled with goods that they're supposed to deliver somewhere. Yeah. So how can you, I mean, ob obviously you're going to cut, because if you don't have a driver, well, no one needs to stop to sleep, to eat, all that. Yeah. But in what, what other ways can you make that more efficient? How can you help to make that number better? Okay. I think uh, you need to start to look at it like how the infrastructure used to work like when you have uh, the OEMs, like the trucking companies, selling a truck to a truck driver, and the truck driver is actually the one that's providing the service. That means that they don't really have any, um, any touch point with each other. So they are just trying to, to get these deals from the, uh, from the, sh um, from the shipping companies. Yeah. And uh, what we, we are doing is that we're trying to look from a freight perspective, where we try to, together with our customers, look into how do they ship today and how can we make this more efficient. So I really believe what we're doing is that we're really trying to solve how you can optimize your transport so that you can actually uh, increase the filling rate of the trucks. Yeah. So I was thinking, do you have a fa favorite failure of yours that that apparently set up a later success? Like something that you do now or that you're able to do now that you could not do if you didn't go through this, this failure or, or fear that you faced? Mm. I think two like realizations that come from many failures um, yeah, throughout my life. I mean, the first that life is a marathon, not a sprint. And I think especially when you're here studying, you think that like life is a sprint, yeah. uh, that if I don't, uh, if, if I don't get A on this exam, my life is over because then I won't get an internship at uh, McKinsey or Goldman Sachs or Boston Consulting Group or whatever it is. While you, um, um, I mean, you just realize that life is more of a marathon with a lot of sprints. And uh, I think for, you know, for driven, ambitious um, um, people, all sprints won't be successful. Uh, but uh, the marathon, if you keep the, the right direction, if you're, you know, behave ethically and morally right, and you surround yourself with uh, with other good people, the marathon will be a successful one. Yeah. But all sprints won't be. Yeah. Um, and I think the second thing also is, um, you know, how to think around risk, because I think uh, when. Um, um, you know, a lot of my classmates, including me, uh, at some point when I was studying here, was you know we were thinking that it's a huge risk if I don't start working at a consultancy firm or at a bank or whatever it is. But now my my, my mindset is a bit more like I mean it, um, because I love building things. I love uh, why I'm an entrepreneur is basically because of two things. I love building things, you know, see the, create something from scratch, see people using it, see people, you know, interacting with it. And the second thing is freedom. Uh, I want freedom, you know, be able to wear yeah, whatever clothes I want to, you know, work with the people I want to and work on the hours I want to. Um, and uh, then being an entrepreneur is a quite good choice. Um, but I think now when I think about like a normal eight to five or nine to five, uh, uh, job, uh, I actually see that as you know the biggest risk in life because the only thing we don't have is like time, and me sitting at a nine to five job, uh, not being able to create and not um, um, uh, not having freedom and also not a huge upside is like a big risk. But being an entrepreneur and you know building things in a country like Sweden, where especially if you've studied here at Stockholm School of Economics, I mean you have the social benefit system, you will always be able to find a job. Why not then you know go out, try to build some, something uh, with um, yeah, with a group of good people and have uh, um, a lot of ups and downs. Uh, but what you have when you're building something and uh, when you're an entrepreneur is unlimited upside. It's like this amazing option with uh, uh, with the unlimited upside yeah. because you own equity, and in the end, uh, you won't get rich by uh, by getting a salary because then you're selling your time. And then you start. This is around 2003, right? 2003, we started Volat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what was the first steps like? Because I mean, to uh, to acquire companies, you need capital. If yeah. I know what I know now, yeah. I would never ever have started <laughs> okay. because it was much more tricky than what I what I could expect. Yeah. Uh, so just finding the first company to acquire. You should remember, Carl and I was like 33, 34. We have no experience really about doing this, and no sort of. So everyone we met was very skeptic. 
you young guys should acquire companies? Do you have the money? Do you have the knowledge? Will you do it? Uh, so it was hard to just find something to acquire. Yeah. And how did it go about? What happened? Your first, first company? I was at Ernst & Young. I was senior manager, so I was selling projects. And I thought, OK, I will acquire companies. Everyone will love me because I've been knocking doors trying to sell. And now I will yeah. be the buyer. It, I will be highly loved. I will get fika of everyone, and they will just love me. But they didn't. So I, I wrote 100 emails trying to get meetings with uh, corporate uh, firms to advisors just trying to get meetings and had quite a lot of meetings and uh, after like half a year I was thinking we will not succeed but then I got a happy lucky break and we met with PricewaterhouseCoopers and they had tournament to sale and we we managed to uh, convince the owners that we would be a very good new owner of the of tournament okay so so how do you kind of stay you said just before the cameras went on, yeah, you, you have a problem with focusing, but you're also, in like a ma macro way, very focused. <laughs> like, how do you, um, how do you make sure that you spend your time wisely, if you have so many things going on at the same time? I uh, yeah, actually need to remind myself. Think, people think that I'm smart, but I'm the stupidest person I know. It takes me a long time to learn something and once I've learned it I forget it very quickly so that's why I need my own notes to self in the form of tattoos so one of those reminders are a arrow pointing downwards reminding myself not to say yes to things that would look good on paper or in my resume or that I find myself thinking that I ought to do this, though I don't really want to. And one arrow pointing upwards, thumbs up to whenever I find myself wanting to do something, but hesitating, is this really something I should do? What would people say? And to remind myself that do things I want to do, then I will have the energy I will have the focus to do it well enough to be worth the while for me and hopefully for others. And, and don't do all the things that I just ought to do that don't really give me any energy and make it hard to focus. So simple enough, but I learned it the very hard way and I need to remind myself <laughs> constantly.